If you were asked why there's such an increase in the numbers of young people who are deciding to go into the trans movement, what would you say? I want to share my surgery experiences with them because they're about to be going through the same thing. and I want them to know what it was like for me, but I also don't want to freak them out. Jazz to me is such an inspiration because like growing up, I didn't really have like an advocate or anyone that I looked to like as a transgender like role model. If you were asked to describe the key factors behind kids deciding to transition into that lifestyle, would you know what they are? Okay, um, so when are you getting your surgery? About a year from now. What about you, Charlie? So I'm looking to do my surgery probably after I graduate high school. Would it surprise you to know that predators are counting on you not knowing? Alex Aaron, founder of the Gender Mapping Project, and co-founder of Partners for Ethical Care. Well, she has some very sobering words for parents and those who care about protecting vulnerable, gender-confused young people who have untreated mental health issues, who are being targeted for financial and sexual exploitation by the most adept of predators. So, I mean, there's, there's layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of, of predation uh, on this uh, and involved in this. Um, and I feel like it just comes from absolutely all angles. There's no really, um, it, it's so unthinkable and so disgusting that it's even hard for me to just describe it to you. We'll hear from Alex Aaron next as we resume our intensive interview on the hidden dangers within the trans movement on this edition of the Predator Watch podcast. Predator Watch provides a brief overview of important stories in the news or issues of concern as they relate to understanding the nature of sexual predators, their characteristics, how their minds operate, their methods of manipulation, and what motivates them. They hide in plain sight, can smell an opportunity a mile away, and count on people not understanding just how dark their hearts are and how intent they are about always producing victims. Stay tuned as John Euler, a licensed professional counselor with over 25 years of professional experience treating both survivors and sexual predators, shares his insights on this edition of Predator Watch. You know, um, Alex, you, you are helping us immensely First of all, there's not enough time in the day for us all to try to research all facets of this. What parents need to understand is there are people actively vying for their children, number one. So you have a convergence in the trans deception and trans movement. You have a convergence of a lot of special interests, but it's either sexually deviant and or monetary driven. And oftentimes monetary is throughout the whole thing. You have many kids. And when you look at the rise of the gender referrals, female referrals, and I don't get into all the terms. I just go back to basics, right? Because they're changing the terms all the time. All the time. So where it used to be, once upon a time, clinically, if there was a gender-confused kid, it would be a boy. Everything has shifted. That is not by accident. Girls are now raised in an environment, in a culture that is sex saturated. Look at even what happens in the Super Bowls. But you have these girls that are just normal. So I'm going to take this kind of from the beginning. You have a normal kid that is raised in an environment where they now get messages and scripts, as it were, as far as what is a girl supposed to be like. So we've either got Barbies and hyper... I'm not ragging on Barbies, but... Right? So we're introduced to these perfect creatures in magazines and uh, checkout stands. So we have Vogue and we have... Uh, you know, the, this is the standard that a girl is supposed to measure up to. So she gets discouraged at the very least. That's, this is long before handheld electronic devices. So, and then you have a lot of kids being perped on. So all a girl knows is, well, I, I, don't, I don't want that. I can't compete with that. And now handheld, you know, electronics comes along the internet. And now all girls know is all these boys are looking at porn. And now what direction is porn taken? Porn then took what it normally will, 
Deviance is very predict- predictable in terms of the stages downward. I learned that from the inmates and the uh, sex offenders, that eventually you're going to have the bondage and the kink kind of uh, diabolic- diabolical stuff because women women think that it's Fifty Shades of Grey with a, a storyline. All the sex offenders know this, and they just love it, the fact that these women have been suckered by... Fifty Shades of Grey and the like. Well, now Fifty Shades of Grey is sold at Walmart under entertainment. So girls see this. They start to see that if they go down what they're being told is the normal female path, well, where is that going to end up? Torture, what looks like middle age, you know, the torture in the middle ages. So they don't want anything to do with that. So they recoil into what they think is the safety of the trans, trans movement. But they don't know that waiting in the wings of the trans movement now are a whole different kind of predatory um, audience. How many of you feel that you were blindly affirmed? I didn't get enough pushback on transitioning. I went for two appointments, and after the second one, I had like my letter to go get on cross-sex hormones. Two visits? That's it? Because when I went in to see my doctor, he just took my word for it and just, I I feel like that is so unethical. I think instead of just like, you know, receiving a letter or just taking somebody, a patient's word for it, I think they should do a little bit more evaluating than that. But yeah, because teens and kids are so fluctuating and they're very extremely aware of what other people around them are doing, what's their opinions, and they're so, they're sponges, they just absorb everything and they want to take on so many different identities as they're going. So having uh, someone being like, stop, (laughs) let's think about this for the next 10 years or something, slow down. Uh, even though that kid might suffer, I would rather have that kid suffer as a teenager than suffer with a mutilated body, you know, and then regretting every decision they made when they were in high school. That I was so obsessed. This should have been some sort of red flag to someone somewhere. There were all these red flags, and I honestly wish that somebody had pointed them out to me and then I might not have transitioned in the first place. And the therapist that I found um, only required one therapy session in order for her to be comfortable writing this letter for me. Were you diagnosed when you were younger, like by an actual clinician, or how did you Um, come to accept that you were transgender in your mind? um, Well, as a child, I never got uh, diagnosed by any clinic, and not until like I went out on my own at age 18, 19, when I did it on my own. Um, the clinic that I had gone to around 18, 19, well, 18 is when I started to go. Um, the therapist that I got, uh, she actually told me that she could get me all the paperwork that I needed to transition that after my first session with her. I wanted to find ways of dealing with my gender issues that aren't medically transitioning, and those ways weren't presented to me. The only solution that was presented was chopping your breasts off, injecting yourself with hormones, and becoming a man. One is they're either now going to start to financially make profit off of body parts and pharmaceuticals, Well, let's say a kid gets far enough into that and realizes, you know what, I don't know if I want my breast chopped off. What do I do? And you just referenced now the perfect happy medium, which is they're into that movement. And then somebody like Buck Angel comes along and says, no, no, you can keep your body parts. As a matter of fact, we can help you make money off of your body parts. And without knowing it, this young girl is starting to be solicited and groomed into, by degree, some form of Mm -hmm. sexual exploitation and or prostitution. Give me your feedback Mm -hmm. on what I just said. Yeah, so the the thing about, I mean, 
Um, I agree with you completely, but there's another level that you're that we are not discussing here, and that is actually the doctors um, who are recommending, especially in in the U.S., where you know um, there's a transactional, um, you know, there there's a pay for what you can afford medical system. So Joanna Olson Kennedy. Um, who is this um, kind of horrifying human being, um, gender surgeon, um, you know, if you're old enough to recite the ABC, she'll probably do surgery on you. Right? But so what we do know is that adolescents actually have the capacity to make a reasoned, logical decision. And here's the other thing about chest surgery. If you want breasts at a later point in your life, you can go and get them. Right? But so what we do know is that adolescents actually have the capacity to make a reasoned, logical decision. And here's the other thing about chest surgery. If you want breasts at a later point in your life, you can go and get them. Now, she said that 30% of her clients are coming from the quote unquote sex industry or sex work, as she, you know, um, called it, which is a laughable term. So the, a lot of these doctors are, prop, you know, suggesting uh, to their clients, to, to, to their patients um, to consider raising their money either on GoFundMe uh, or by, by actually engaging in prostitution. And I've reported on several young girls who are in street prostitution uh, raising money for their double mastectomies. Uh, and these, these young women are the most vulnerable of vulnerable. They're exactly as you, you know, describe, um, they come from a background of abuse. They were, you know, prepared for this for many, many years, you know, as, as predators do, they prepare you for a long time for this kind of exploitation. Um, so uh, the, the predators are coming from so many different places. Even um, your average doctor who is removing breasts for $13,000 or for $30,000 is recommending that you go to OnlyFans and GoFundMe to get the money that you need for her to do that, that surgery on you. Um, and there's, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the sad part is, is that girls don't make money on only, you know, young FTMs don't make money on OnlyFans. They make, you know, $170 um, selling their pictures, which gets more and more depraved. You know, the ceiling gets more and more depraved as, as things progress. Um, so that that's all they're actually making is 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 that. But then it gets on to the one on one conversations that they're having with their fans, um, who end up just being Johns, um, or they end up being managed, you know, um, pimped. Bands a month, like like I was making such easy quick money and I honestly started off by just basically posting the same things I was posting on Instagram and, and this is why it is a scam. After a couple of months you're going to lose subscribers because they're like only signing up because of the hype. Only fans has a reputation. That's the thing. When you hear of an OnlyFans, you're you're automatically or even a private Snapchat, you're automatically thinking like there's porn, there's nudes, there's sex tapes all on this thing. They're really subscribing just to see the hype, right? They're trying to see if they can see your nudes, they're trying to see if they can see your sex tapes, all of that. But then when they see what you're actually posting on there, and if it doesn't reach like what they imagine and then what they want to see you doing, then they're gonna unsubscribe. Unless you are okay with being that girl and doing those things and making that a full-time job where you're basically going to be transitioning into a like a porn star so i mean there's there's layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of of predation uh on this uh and involved in this um and i feel like it just comes from absolutely all angles there's no really, um, it, 
it's so unthinkable and so disgusting that it's even hard for me to just describe it to you. I, I always say to people, take a wonder around yourself. Take a wonder around OnlyFans. Take a wonder around Pornhub and see um, and see where you get up to. You know, see where it takes you. Uh, see the natural line, the four or five clicks that you are away from from from, from seeing this. Um, highly dangerous material which you cannot unsee you, know, you you can't go back in time and say oh i i wish i didn't see that i'll erase it like a hard drive no it doesn't work like that inevitably pornography is involved it's so involved now we call it a porn culture so i guess i've been uh, now i've begun using that term Unless a child has been influenced by porn, this is my contention. But if the culture, if it's so ubiquitous, I mean, look at the most recent Super Bowl halftime thing with J-Lo. That used to be considered virtually, that used to be considered pornography virtually. So now it's on the halftime show. As a matter of fact, when I uh, make my different podcasts, and if I want to add graphics, pardon the pun, right? I want to add pictures, just a simple Google search, I have to be very, very careful just on a regular Google search that any kid can perform. I have to be very careful in the words I put in to just simply grab a, a picture to put it in to illustrate this yet we have kids that are accessing this the predators know it they've saturated these kids their minds and so there's very little shock value and now it's in the schools as far as soji sex ed and the parents need to understand and alex what you just said is so crucial that to appreciate what really is going on with the trans movement you have to understand what you are being sold is a marketing package that behind the scenes. There are two worlds that have converged. One is people want to make money off of your kids. And they want your kids sex. They want to cross sexual boundaries. You have monetary predators or monetary predators and sexual predators. And they are feeding off the same carcass. And porn is the thing that softens the target, much like D-Day, how the invasion fleet pounded the, the shores with all these shells to soften it up so that the invasion could take place. So the aerial onslaught has been porn. Now kids are saying they knew they were uh, bisexual by age 11. Really, so prior to puberty... A child has a sexual thought without it being introduced from the outside? No. Somebody's been preying upon this child. And mm -hmm. Alex, you mentioned the power of porn and mm -hmm. in the things that you fight and also personally, to whatever mm -hmm. extent you feel comfortable, do you want to help people understand that the trans movement and porn are inextricably t uh, intertwined? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, another element that we're not even really discussing here is the hypnosissy porn. Um, so the hypnosissy porn is this whole other beast um, where you're actually seeing ASMR videos um, where you're, uh, have you heard about this, this type no, of uh, pornography? I've, I've just heard of it. So fill us in, educate us. Oh, wow. Here we go. Well, let me see. Um, so it's, it's something which is causing a lot of, you know, um, many, many times men fall in, boys, men, um, fall into hypnosis porn addiction just by being exposed to the regular degrading, disgusting pornography that's out there. Um, they're, they may not even necessarily be seeking it. Uh, but then they're taken into this, this world, this underworld, um, which is called hypnosissy porn. I want you to relax, lie down, and listen to my voice. As you listen to my words, just let all the muscles in your shoulders release. Each breath, you release more tension. 
I'm going to count you down from 10 to 0. My voice is taking you gently into a calm place. Slipping downwards now with each breath. Each number that goes by. Each number that goes down and down. Check out. Buy those items. Hmm? Buy those sexy items right now. Check out. Check out my little sister. This isn't a couple of videos here. This is the pathway to medicalization of young males. Um, Hypnosissy porn, there's 25,000 videos on Pornhub alone. It's well accepted, right? Spoken about and understood in most online circles and has gained a lot of acceptance in the world of academia. Um, so sissification and hypnosissy porn um, have been you know, named uh, which something which has led to prominent men transitioning, like Andrea Long Chu, who is a man pretending to be a woman, uh, who wrote a book called Females. And um, so, while there is a, a, a subset of hypnosissy porn where they fantasize about taking hormones, having surgeries, um, uh, and going through this sissification, um, if you rock up to a Planned Parenthood and say, I'm addicted to hypnosissy porn, I want you to sissify me, or I want to have estrogen. Um, they're, they're not screening for that. They're not looking for that. Um, so so the, the addiction to all pornography is harmful, but addiction to hypnosissy porn is actually life-threatening for many people. To be kidnapped, put on hormones, drugged, restrained and used like this repeatedly being trained to be a sissy whore. That's the dream. Then, they sell you to a pimp. Uh, before the informed consent model was passed, there was a couple of safeguards that were, you know, that were likely to be, be used before somebody was full-blown addicted to hypnosissy porn. Uh, so, you know, uh, hypnosissy porn, it leads, there's a website called I Am A Sissy, uh, where there's just endless, endless, endless videos of these men who are so mentally ill. You can get rid of them now. They're so uncomfortable. You don't like them, do you? No. No. That was your old life. Your new life is about comfort. Do you know what this is? It's so soft. And cottony. a little rustling noise. It's your new diaper, sissy baby. You're going to love wearing diapers. They're so cozy. It's like a hug right around your body. Uh, porn sick, quite literally porn sick. Um, and then if you go into their subreddit group, um, there's a whole subsection of them who are saying, I'm suicidal. I'm totally addicted to this. Hypnosissy porn has taken over my life. I am absolutely, my emotional state is at the end. I may kill myself. Um, um, I can't leave my house because I'm spending 17 hours a day doing this stuff. Um, so this, this hypnosissy porn is quite the hook for you know, getting um, these, these men addicted and these boys addicted. And it's hypnosissy porn is often sold um, with academics to be a lifestyle. It's not a lifestyle. It's an addiction. Could all the porn they've been watching have done something to their brains? Now there's the nerve, you see it right there. Don Helton's been peering inside people's heads.
for 21 years, a brain surgeon in San Antonio, a world expert on this stuff. I think there's ample evidence that pornography rewires the brain in a very dramatic fashion. Four years ago, Don put forward the controversial theory that internet porn could be as addictive as cocaine. We predicted that based on the way sex causes these reward chemicals in the brain to uh, be produced, that we would see some of the same brain scan findings that we find with drugs. And the latest research seems to be proving him right. At Cambridge University, they scan the brains of 19 compulsive porn users and 19 healthy men are watching explicit internet pornography. Researchers wanted to know what would happen to their reward centers. That's the part of the brain which lights up when we do the things we enjoy, like eating or having sex. It's fueled by packets of dopamine. While the control group got a little buzz from the porn, the reward centers of the porn users lit up like Christmas trees, just like the scans of cocaine addicts. They wanted more, and they wanted it now. There are still academics out there who say there's no such thing as porn addiction. It's just people with high libidos doing their thing. Do you think that porn addiction has been proven beyond doubt? To me, the proof has been there for several years. The study out of Germany, it showed that... There and last year, more supporting evidence. The Max Planck Institute in Germany identified two physical changes in the brains of Internet porn users. First, a rewiring of the frontal lobe, the part of the brain that tells us to stop overindulging, our braking system. It's essentially wearing out of the braking system. It's impeding the signal from the brake to the reward center. The second and most stunning neurological discovery that high-speed internet porn might actually shrink the brain. This change in volume, the shrinkage in this reward area, was more pronounced the more hours per week the person watched pornography. And that means less gray matter in the part of the brain associated with decision-making and motivation. There's a third aspect of this emerging science, which is even more worrying from a social point of view. The more porn you watch, the more extreme your brain wants it to be. So he needs more. The same porn isn't going to do it. It's going to require a bigger kick. It started out very soft core, you know, with uh, me Googling body parts, right? And then it would escalate to, um, you know, a couple guys, one girl, or gang bangs. And then it got, it kind of, you know, varied what I would watch. And I would search for things that were shocking or that created anxiety, um, like very abusive and misogynistic stuff. But why would our brains do that to us? Novelty. Novelty. Our brains want to learn something new. We're always trying to learn something new. It's what, we, it's what we do. Our brains want to learn. And we need new. And new is aggression. New is younger. It's as pop. You are solidifying. You're having a full body experience. What do I mean by that? You are reciting mantras like, I am a sissy, I am a sissy, I am a sissy, sissify me master, sissify me master, whilst having a full body experience, an orgasm. Tell me how a 15 year old boy is supposed to contend with that. I mean, there's, it's so dark, so sick, so twisted, so disturbing. And I don't go into the, the world of the truly sick and depraved pornography. I just go at the normal stuff that's available and take a look and report on it, right? So you can only imagine what the underbelly looks like. Because I'm, I'm just surface level looking at hypnosis porn and seeing these 25,000 videos and watching 10 second clips. I'm not going into the underground, the stuff that's sold, um, you know, that's, that, that's, that's not hosted on Pornhub. God only knows what that, you know, hardcore, hardcore, hypnosis porn actually is. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's like ritual sacrifices or something. There, I mean, uh, Alex, how did you know that's where, you know, when you, when you look at the one and only interview 
Okay, I don't care HBO or whatever. Um, you know, one of those uh, stations did a series on Ted Bundy. Mm -hmm. Okay, the rea the reality as far as what Ted Bundy really thought was disclosed by Ted Bundy to James Dobson. Ted Bundy only gave one interview, one last interview. Mm -hmm. just uh, hours, as it were, before he was to be executed mm -hmm. in the electric chair in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. He gave that interview to James Dobson. Because out of all the things that Ted Bundy was seeing, as far as, as people were conjecturing, what caused Ted Bundy to do what he did, mm -hmm. Ted Bundy wanted to clarify. Yes, and, I, I, and this is something I think I want to emphasize, is the... The, the, the most damaging uh, uh, kinds of pornography, in my, again, I'm talking from personal experience, uh, hard, real personal experience, the most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence and, and sexual violence. Because the wedding of those two forces, as, as I know only too well, brings about behavior that is just, uh, mm. is just uh, too terrible to describe. Now walk me through that. What was going on in your mind at that time? Okay, before we go any further, I think I mean, it's important to me and, uh, and the people the people believe what I'm saying to tell you that that I'm not blaming pornography and not saying that it caused me and, and to go out and do certain things. And I take full responsibility for whatever I've done and all the things that I've done. That's not the question here. The question and, and, and the issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior. It fueled your fantasies. Well, in, in the beginning it fuels this kind of thought process. Then it, at a certain time it's instrumental in what I would say crystallizing it, make it in, making it into something which is almost an, like a separate entity inside. And that in, at that point, you're at the verge, or I was at the verge of acting out on this on this kind of these kinds of things. Now, I really want to understand that you had gone about as far as you could go in your own fantasy life mm -hmm. with printed material, and you made or printed and video or film Fol or film photos, magazines, yeah. what have you. Yeah. And and then there was the urge to take that little step or big step over to a physical right. uh, event. And it happens, it, it happened in stages, gradually. It doesn't necessarily, not to me at least, happen overnight. My experience with, I say pornography generally, but with pornography that deals on a violent level with the sexuality, um, is that once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction, uh, like other kinds of addiction, of addiction you keep, I would keep looking for more potent, more explicit, yeah. more it's graphic kinds of material. Mm -hmm. Like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, harder, something which which gives you a greater uh, sense of, uh, of uh, excitement. Until you reach the point where the pornography only goes so far. You reach that jumping off point where you begin to wonder if, if maybe actually doing it will give you that which is beyond just reading about it or looking at it. How long did you stay at that point before you actually assaulted someone? Well, yeah, you see, <clears throat> that is a very delicate point in my own development. And we're talking about something, we're talking about having reached the point or a, a, a gray area that surrounded that point over a course of years. You don't remember years. how long that well, was? Well, I, I would say, I would say a couple of years. And what was, I was dealing with there were very strong inhibitions against criminal behavior, violent behavior that had been conditioned into me, bred into me in my environment, in my neighborhood, in my church, uh, in my school. Um, things which said, no, this is wrong. I mean, this, I mean even to think of it is wrong, but it, certainly to do it is wrong. And you're on, well, I'm on that edge and these, the last, the, the, you might say, the last vestiges of restraint. Uh, the barriers to actually doing something were being tested constantly and assault uh, assailed um, through the kind of fantasy life that was fueled largely by pornography. Do you remember what pushed you over that edge? 
Do you remember well, the decision to go for it? Do you remember where you decided to throw caution to the wind? Again, when you say pushed, I don't. I, I know what you're saying. I don't want to yes. infer again. I, that, I understand that. That, that I was that, 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 that I was clear. some helpless yeah. kind of a victim, and yet uh, we're talking about an influence which, that is, the influence of violent types of media and, and violent pornography, which had an, was, was an indispensable link in the chain of behavior, the, the chain of events that led to the behaviors, to the, to the assaults, to the murders, and what, and what have you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to describe. Uh, uh, the, the sensation of, the, the, of, of reaching that point where, you, where I knew It was like something had, say, snapped. That I knew that uh, that I couldn't control it anymore. That these barriers that that I had had been uh, I had learned as a child uh, that had been instilled in me were not enough to hold me back with respect to seeking out and, and harming somebody. Would it be accurate to call that a uh, a frenzy, a sexual frenzy? Well, yes, it, that's one way to describe it. A compulsion. A a. a building up of, of this destructive energy. A lot of people think that Ted Bundy was lying. I have worked personally, up close and personal, with many, many serial rapists and murderers. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you what Ted Bundy shared, I heard over and over. What Ted Bundy said was this, and this was back in the 70s. Think about mm -hmm. the porn back then. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even on the mm -hmm. internet. Ted Bundy said he came across a Playboy in a dumpster, and that started his interest. And Ted Bundy predicted that there were many Ted Bundys that were ripe to be influenced, and Ted was 100% correct. Mm -hmm. Sexual psychopaths are not, it's neither nurture, nor nature, nor genetics. It is over time, with exposure, and putting the brakes on your conscience. And you will go down a certain path. And that's why, on the sex offender unit, the high-intensity high sex, uh, sexually violent predator unit that I headed up, I had access to, not just in that situation, but for 11 years, I had access to all the criminal histories of these guys. And time and time again, you will find not only is there porn, 100% of the time, but there is snuff porn, depending upon the nature of the, the offense. And so as deviance takes a guy dark and deviant, inevitably he's going to get into, prior to child porn, he's going to get into bestiality and then snuff porn. And Alex, as you were describing how dark this stuff gets, this is a predator's playground this is his dream come true where you have kids that are grooming themselves virtually so that now a sexual predator doesn't have any work left to do because the mm -hmm. child uh, this young person has no boundaries whatsoever and thinks any deviance is normal mm -hmm. yeah and, and like you're saying with uh, j-lo i mean a lot of um the time uh, the the girls are coming ready to the porn set, whether or not they reach it. I mean, they're, they're being groomed by the Nicki Minaj, by the, the, the WAP, by these things, by these highly bizarre, um, deviant behaviors. They're coming ready. You know, they're preparing them for a life of pornography. Whether or not they end up on a porn set is, is something totally different. Maybe they are being groomed for that and that's the culture that is that is doing that to these girls well we'll have to stop at this point in the interview with alex aaron due to time constraints but in the third and final part of our interview we'll resume our intensive discussion about the hidden dangers of the trans movement as alex helps us gain additional insights on how predators are targeting the most vulnerable of young people 
on the next edition of the Predator Watch Podcast. You've been listening to Predator Watch, dedicated to shining the light of truth about the nature of the most sophisticated of sexual predators most likely to target places where victims are most easily accessed. For John Mueller and the entire team, thanks for listening. Predator Watch has been sponsored by SurvivorSupport.net. As a nonprofit organization, Survivor Support is dependent upon the generosity of people who believe in its mission of supporting survivors. Please consider becoming a monthly supporter of this important work.